Welcome to day two of our virtual seminars. And we are so excited today because we're going to hear about props. Many of you already know this great guest that we have, but uh, uh, this is the great Ben Holman, our props director. Ben, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been with the festival, et cetera, and what we're going to do today. Sure. Um, so this is my 27th year with the Shakespeare Festival. I started on Run Crew. I was a crew head a props artisan, a prop master, and in 2000, I became props director. So it's my 20th year in charge of the props department. Today, um, my assistant and I, uh, early in the week, filmed a video, a tour of our warehouse. Um, so we're going to uh, watch that video. Um, and while that's going, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the comments on Facebook. Um, and then when the video is over, um, we'll come back into this format, and uh, we will answer as many of those questions as we have time for in the remaining time. Cool. So enjoy the video, and we'll chat in a little bit. Very good. Hello everyone, my name is Ben Homan. I'm the props director here at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Today we're gonna to give you a little tour of our warehouse. We talk about it a lot in my seminars, but you've never got a chance to see it. So walk down a couple aisles and show you some of our favorite things that we have here in stock. So come on down. So our first aisle is basically our chair aisle. Um, we being a Shakespeare Festival have a throne section, uh, two, two, two areas full of thrones. Um, we have chairs of all different types. Um, they're not really organized in a way that would make sense to other people, but they make sense to kind of us. So they're grouped by style, type, um, and how we use them. Um, so yeah. here we have a dead body. This is uh, was last to Juliet. No, was last to Ophelia in a production of Hamlet uh, last year. Um, we do a lot of texturing and distressing of things. So this bench is sandblasted. Um, to pull out the grain. This one here, the artisans actually took knives and carved into it with graffiti as if it was in a bar. So this was probably used in a production of Merry Wives, uh, more than likely in one of the bar scenes. Um, come on then. Uh, we just have lots of stuff. Uh, we think we have about a thousand pieces of furniture. We're currently working on an inventory system. Um, with some of our downtime right now, we're actually using that to our advantage to get some things organized and figured out. So um, hopefully in a year, I'll have an actual number of how many pieces of furniture we have in the warehouse, but there's a lot. Um, and we pull a lot every year. We probably pull about 50% of our props from any given season um, and modify them in some way, reupholster, repaint, things like that. Um, We'll buy about 25% new and modify those, and then we'll build about 25%. Those are averages, and they change year to year, but that's basically kind of uh, about what we do on any given year. Okay. So as an example, these two chairs, which are a set, we bought from Overstock a couple of years ago. Um, I believe they were a light tan when we first got them. Um, so we stained them. We took the upholstery off from Overstock. We stained them. Um, and then we upholstered both of them in this red fabric for Treasure Island. We also molded these little uh, decorative elements um, out of resin. This one is probably missing, it is. Um, and added those to give it a little more oomph. Uh, and then last year for Henry VI, we were looking for something to be a throne, um, but our time period was shifting throughout the show. And so we didn't want to use one of our sort of historically accurate thrones. Uh, so instead our designer chose this chair, which we reupholstered into this gold fabric to give it more of a royal appearance. Um, so the next time we use these, we may reupholster them again and make them into a set again, or we may use just one of them. Um, so it's one of those we kind of reuse our stock on a regular basis. So we have some collections in the warehouse that don't really have a good spot to go, like our medieval section. Um, so we have a lot of torches and shield uh, type things that might be on fireplaces or things like that. So we have several suits of armor. Um, this is one. There are two more here around the corner because we had to get our lift through here the other day. Um, but so this becomes our, like our little medieval section. Um, and then we have planters. Um, again, something else that doesn't really have a home are these giant uh, chandelier candelabra things that we built for Three Musketeers a number of years ago. Um, yeah. um, as I said, doing inventory, we're working on stools right now, which is why this aisle is a complete mess because we've pulled all of the stools off of the shelves um, to inventory them all. Um, and then put them back up. So those empty shelves that you see, a couple of those were just added a couple weeks ago, um, and all the stools will end up going up there. So very carefully, we'll come down this aisle. Um, so this is sort of tables 
um, and more large upholstered furniture. So uh, wingback chairs, couches, um, Victorian settees, things like that. Um, and then every kind of table imaginable. Um, we probably have about, I would guess, 200 tables, uh, maybe a little more than that. Um, we also, I don't know if we can get up high enough, but all of our chandeliers are hung from the rafters in this aisle. Um, again, just a way to be able to see what we have and not to pile them up or stack them. Um, we even reused some of our props um, as warehouse uh, materials. So this uh, rolling stepladder here uh, was actually bought for guys and dolls and was used as a prop in the show in the sewer scene. But now we use it to help get stuff off of the shelves in the warehouse. Um, and then this next ladder um, was actually bought um, and painted to look really old and abused um, for the Iliad uh, from a couple years ago. And because it's a nice tall platform ladder, um, we also use it in the warehouse um, to help get stuff down off of shelves and things like that. So multiple uses for things. Um, so one of the things that we do a lot of at the festival is reuse items in different ways um, or apply them to other things to make things look more interesting or textured or things like that. So a couple examples of that. This microphone, which looks like a period um, like 20s or 30s microphone, is actually the innards um, from a couple of telephones. Um, and then some springs and a whole bunch of eye bolts. And then this outside ring is actually just a piece of plastic PVC. Um, to buy a period microphone like this would be hundreds of dollars. Um, and we don't need it to function because generally when we're using something like this, the actors are gonna have a wireless mic on. Um, so we don't need the functionality, we just need the look. And so this we're able to put together for maybe five or six dollars and some scraps from the warehouse um, and can achieve the same sort of visual look. Um, we also do a lot of walking sticks of different types. Um, and they're, a lot of times they're very, very specific. So some of these may be a little hard to see, but this is a Prospero staff uh, from a Tempest. Um, and this one is where the designer and the director thought the idea uh, that Prospero was like Leonardo da Vinci. Um, a Renaissance man. And so this entire thing is actually a stick we found in the creek bed, Cedar Creek. Um, and an artisan sat with um, pages out of Leonardo's sketchbook, or reproductions of pages of Leonardo's sketchbook, and just drew um, and wrote in Latin um, all over the staff. We had to make two of these because at the end of the show, he breaks his staff. And we ran for about 30 performances and didn't want us to do a staff for every performance. So we made a breakaway staff and the normal staff. Um, and so we have a pair of these. Um, another staff, this is Merlin's staff from Camelot, which just goes way back. Um, the designer designed basically a stick that was carved to have things like hands. Here's a little hand and there's an eyeball. At the top here, we actually have a little wizard. Um, again, to carve this out of wood and for it to survive for our summer when it's so dry here, it probably would have cracked and broken at some point. So instead, this is a piece of plastic PVC pipe and it's covered with a material called friendly plastic, which is a, a little pellet material that you heat up in water and it gets moldable and you can shape it and when it dries, um, you can then paint it, um, uh, sand it, work with it. Um, and so this whole thing is covered with friendly plastic to bring out all of these um, details that the designer had drawn into the sketch, um, but also to make it survive um, in our climate. Uh, two more. Um, this one um, is actually before my time, so it's at least 30 years old. Um, and this is basically a pool cue that's been covered in layers of industrial felt. So it's a thick felt and then glue is put on it to make it really um, stiff and hard. And it looks like it's carved. It's a really fun piece. Again, looks really cool, like someone spent hours and hours carving it, but fairly simple to put together. And then this one is one of my favorites. Um, this is the Mad Queen, uh, Queen Margaret from Richard. Um, and this is literally just a piece of dowel covered in lace, layers and layers of lace, and then beads and some seashells. Um, and um, here's a little plastic monkey. We put monkeys in every show. So there's a little monkey, some little foam pieces we got from the craft store. This top is a plastic Christmas ornament. Um, and again, we don't see the detail that close from from uh, from the stage, but when you're in the audience and you look at this and the light hits it, it just creates a great texture um, and visually is a very interesting piece. Whereas if it was just a dowel painted gold, it wouldn't be that really that interesting to look at. Um, so, so we not only do we buy stuff, make stuff, and pull stuff. But we also take donations. Uh, we're constantly looking for old stuff. Um, sometimes we can't afford the piece we really need. So uh, we're happy to take donations, um, uh, tax write-offs. Uh, you can get a tax donation letter for the IRS for donating stuff to us. Um, and in fact, this uh, giant buffet 
um, was just donated to us um, about a week ago. Um, uh, it's two pieces that go together. Um, we're working on building a cart for it so it can sort of roll around and be out of the way when we don't need it. Um, but uh, so yeah, donations are awesome. Um, here we have Artemis and Apollo um, from last year's Twelfth Night. Uh, giant statues um, that were sort of a scenery and paints thing, um, but they weren't sure they wanted to hold on to them. And um, we have quite a few statues in here, and so I don't want to see them go away because the work on them is really cool. So this aisle has some of our taller cabinetry, uh, like this wardrobe, which we uh, we purchased at an antique store in Las Vegas. Uh, this was in the price last year. Um, and then some of our other tall cabinets. A lot of these have been donated over the years by different people. Um, above them are a lot of our trunks. Um, some of these are built. Uh, this one's from Peter and the Starcatcher. Uh, we've repainted some of them over the years, bought some new, um, and then some of them are antiques. Um, some of them have been restored, um, as a prop might be, um, not to its original condition, but nicer condition than when we found it. Um, others um, have been left um, in a very deteriorated state. You may see a lot of these next year in Cymbeline. And then our hand props start here on the other side. Um, so all of our hand props to save space are on rolling baker's racks. Um, so we don't need to have aisles for all of them. So we can literally find the one that we need with the label on the front, pull it out, and then we can find the stuff we need from the shelf um, and, uh, and then put it back. Uh, so it saves us a ton of space. This is one of our animal shelves. We do a lot of animals. Um, I don't know why that is exactly, but we do a lot of animals. Um, so we have an armadillo. It was actually a purchased uh, armadillo um, that was used in uh, Greater Tuna a number of years ago. Um, this is one of our catfish from Big River um, that you have to cut open and find stuff in its belly. Um, so this is fabric that's sewn, uh, has some foam inside of it. Um, the, the gills are made out of a uh, thin plastic sheeting material. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a cool prop. We have a porcupine from a production of Comedy of Errors, our Western Comedy of Errors. Um, this is built on a taxidermy form, so a styrofoam form that we bought from a taxidermy place of a porcupine. It's covered with this really long fur that we found at Joanne Fabrics. And then we just took glue and ran it through the fabric to make it all sort of stiff and crunchy. Um, and then the quills are actually lollipop sticks that we just bent and then glued into the foam. Um, so again, a lot of fairly inexpensive materials, when you put them together with a talented artisan, you get a pretty realistic looking porcupine. Um, one of my other favorite props is, I believe his name is Wilbur, I forget, but um, this is a pig head from Foxfire. Um, in which the old lady um, is basically skinning the the pig to be able to boil it and make souse meat. Um, so again, a taxidermy form, so you can see the foam here. Um, and then we covered it with terry cloth that we used uh, brown paint and glue to make look um, skin-like, texture-like, fur-like, I guess. Um, and then she, as she's peeling it, we actually made individual panels of fur that could peel off with Velcro um, and get replaced every night. Um, so as the scene went on, she could reveal different parts um, of the skin. There's, I think, five or six here that she could peel off. One of the other things this pig had to do is uh, a gentleman comes up to the house and wants to purchase the, the property from her while she's trying to skin the pig, and uh, she struggles trying to get the eye out, so she asks him to help. Um, and so, again, using the dull knife that we gave them. Um, in the ear here is a little, this is actually a food coloring uh, squeeze bottle. Um, and it runs to a tube that runs underneath the, the skin to the corner of the eye here. And as he popped the eye out, um, which is actually a grape, plastic grape that we painted, he squeezed the food coloring bottle and it was full of disappearing ink that shot out the tube onto his white shirt, it made a big black spot. Um, he was only on stage for another minute or two, and then he, he left the stage. And about five minutes later, the way Dispray Ink works, um, because of the heat, it actually disappeared. Um, so we got a big black spot on the costume, no issue in the costume department, but a very uh, a very great moment um, on stage with this, this pig. Okay, so now we're gonna move on down the aisle here. Um, so above us, we have crates and buckets and watering cans and way up high we have um, lampshades, uh, bird cages hanging in this aisle as well. Um, a lot of fake food carts. Um, some stuff's pre-made. Some of it is just individual like fruits, breads, things like that that we can um, 
make platters or baskets or things depending on what the show calls for. Uh, food packaging, some pre-plated dessert things here. Uh, beds, barrels above. Um, then we get into like rustic dishware and then nicer dishware, punch bowls, silver tea sets, things like that. Um, then into crystal bottles of all kinds. We have you know, leather wrapped flasks for our, some of our outdoor Shakespeare plays, um, modern liquor bottles for some of our other plays, uh, more drinkware including pewter, china, stemware. Um, you never know what a show is going to call for, so you have to have a lot of options. Um, also above us is luggage. Most of the luggage is, is two pieces deep, so you have to get up on a ladder to see what's behind. Um, but it's kind of grouped by style, uh, type, sometimes by color. Um, so again, we cover a lot of different periods of time in our shows. So having a lot of luggage options so you can find the right piece to fit um, the show is, is important, which is why we have so much stuff. So here's sort of, this is sort of the back of the warehouse. Um, we have some green show storage and some bins. Then we have rocks and tree stumps, which surprisingly we use quite a bit. Um, and then coming across, we have a lot of existing trees, uh, ficus trees. In a second, you're gonna see some pine trees, some wisteria trees, uh, some fruit trees and things like that. Um, we pull those a lot just to fill in and mask. Um, some more large pots here. And then uh, we were lucky enough that um, many years ago, there was a craft store where the Joanne store is now, uh, that closed, um, we were able to go in and buy their old floral display racks. Um, so all of our stems of flowers are actually sort of by color and type open in these little bins. Um, so designers can come in and literally sort of build bouquets by grabbing individual flowers and they're not getting crushed by being stored in, in bins or things like that, which is actually a really nice uh, feature. Um, we do a lot of greenery. So scenery builds the tree, but we have to put the leaves on it and things like that. So we have bins and bins of leaves and ivy and vines and grapes and all kinds of stuff um, down this aisle um, that help us to do a lot of that. That's reusable until it literally falls apart. Um, so we tend to reuse that for several years. Uh, more hand props on this side, decorative um, dressing. So things that would sit on shelves, um, things like that, globes sailing ships, those kinds of things. Um, above us, um, there's tea carts, uh, bar carts, things like that. Lots of books, both real and fake, beds. Um, we have a little bit of everything. We also do a lot of uh, soft goods, fabric things, banners, curtains, tablecloths, all those sorts of things also fall into our world. So all of these bins along here that you see that are numbered um, uh, are those things sort of sorted. So lacy wafting curtains, American flag bunting, UK flags. Um, so, and these we're constantly updating and adding. Um, this past year we actually went through and we have sort of sections. So there's a bag section and then a tablecloth section. And we actually left numbers at the end of each section so we can add more bins um, and not to like renumber again because we kept having to renumber all of our bins every time we'd add a new bin of tablecloths or something. So we finally sort of fixed that problem. Uh, so wood ladders are getting harder and harder to find. So we have a large collection of vintage wood ladders. Uh, lots more hand props, personal care, smoking, music. Uh, these are instruments that don't play, um, these are the instruments that do play, live somewhere else. Religious and ceremonial items, lots of candles, candlesticks, fire, you can probably hear Turtle, our shop cat, in the background meowing, she's trying to find us. Um, lots, of, lots of fireplaces, um, uh, large and small, my favorite is right here. This is actually a pot-bellied stove that we built for Johnny Guitar, made out of flower pots. So these are plastic flower pots, uh, some wood molding, some wood legs, uh, textured spray paint. Um, pretty convincing from a couple feet away. Um, this is our, there, there she is. Um, this is our wall of lanterns and sconces uh, and sconce shades. Um, so each of these has a number next to it. Um, how many we have and what bin it's located in, and then we have bin storage elsewhere so you know how many of a lantern you want. Uh, we can see if we have that many and get them and pull them out of the bin. Um, so it's really nice to be able to sort of see what we have without having them all out somewhere because they would take up a lot of space. Um, additional uh, lighting stuff as well as pillow storage. 
um, here in the corner. Uh, we'll come around the corner to large musical instruments. Um, we have a lot of pianos, piano fortes, box pianos, some that we've built, uh, some that we've modified, some that we can slide an electronic keyboard into. Um, uh, and then uh, here, um, something else we're never going to use again, but I just couldn't throw it away. This is a, a chunk of the tree from the 2011 production of Midsummer Night's Dream that Fred Adams directed um, uh, for the 50th. Um, it actually has three sets of LED lights in it. I'm hoping someday to maybe get it so it will turn on when the lights come on in the warehouse. Um, so there you go. Those are some of the treasures uh, in our warehouse. And uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I love going on a tour of that. And, I, and you and I have had a dream of actually taking formalized tours out there. Uh, so that people can see that because that's just 20 minutes yeah i mean we we filmed probably about 45 minutes and i mean i can spend i can spend hours in there showing people stuff because there's just so much fun stuff in every aisle well just like that cart that you pulled out that showed the animals in there every single one of those carts have a story it's like a uh kind of Aladdin's Cave of Wonders. So we do have a number of questions here, Ben. Um, so first question, uh, is there a furniture piece that has been reused more than any other productions? And this is from Richie. Um, uh, there's several. Um, we built a throne, actually my assistant, Marielle, uh, built a throne probably almost 20 years ago, maybe 21 years ago, for production of Richard III. And I think it's been on stage probably 16 or 17 times. It's been reupholstered, it's been repainted. We actually beat it with chains one year to distress it for King John. And then the very next year, we had to fill in all of those dents that we made and make it all pretty and smooth and re-gild it uh, with gold leaf. It's been gold, it's been brown, it's been all kinds of things. So that's probably the one we've used the most in my tenure here. But there's, we reuse a lot of stuff. There's a set of chairs we bought for Richard II, um, like six or seven years ago. And they've already been in four or five shows. They've been reupholstered four times. Um, uh, uh, repainted five or six times. Uh, so we tend to reuse uh, that stuff a lot. Cool, cool. Um, and Liz wants to know, and this might be a longer one. Um, she, uh, if she could, she wants to include for her second grade Shakespeare productions props, but doesn't think that that would work. So uh, what are some suggestions at if, with her second graders that she could do in making hand props or making props for her second grade class? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, biggest, the biggest thing that I think is important about props, it's all about imagination. It's about walking through the aisles of a, a store like Walmart or something and saying, okay, I need something that's a period mug, but I have plastic mugs here. So what can I do to that modern mug to make it look more period? Can I add fabric to the outside of it with some glue and paint it to look old? Um, you know, using dowels, like wood dowels for swords or yardsticks or something so they're safe and easy for the kids to handle. Uh, using cardboard, we use a lot of cardboard and tissue paper for texture um, to just to add sort of depth and, and interesting uh, look for things. So you can use even just modern things. Uh, you don't even need to make them look period necessarily, um, but just get the kids, you know, imagination going. It's like, you know, you you need a sword or you need a thing for the witch, you know? So what, what could you use that exists in the world, like at home or here at school, that that could that could be that thing and then by by using it and having the the actors the students you know use their imagination in the way that they handle it and use it it imbues whatever that thing is with with uh propness and makes it into you know an important thing you know this is just a water bottle you know but if you handle it correctly you could you could like why are they handling it that like it's a champagne flute because they think it is a champagne flute, ah. you know, that kind of thing. So I think using imagination, especially with that young of an age, um, is, is sort of the starting point. And simple materials. Like I said, we use lollipop sticks and cardboard and tissue paper all the time, you know, and that's available to anybody. So, so there's two questions here, uh, and I want to ask both of them because it goes on the same thing. How do you learn about the unique materials that you can use to use props? Because I know you know about resins and plastics and all that type of stuff. Uh, she, she asked, this is from Tanya, uh, the plastic for the staff. So how do you learn as a prop artisan about that? And then I'm going to follow it up with another question that somebody asked about um, uh, basically reconfiguring like the popsicle sticks. So start, start with Tanya's question first. Uh, how did you learn about all of these different types of prop formats? Sure. So there's lots of different ways to learn about new materials. Um, one is 
buying stuff and trying it. Um, we, we do a lot of um, uh, trying and failing. Um, uh, we call it research and development. Um, so we'll buy products and try them and be like, oh, that didn't give us the result we wanted, so let's try something else. Um, uh, I also belong to an international prop master group called uh, SPAM, the Society of Properties Artists and Managers. And we have an annual conference um, where we share resources. So prop masters from all over the world get together and say, hey, I learned about this new website or this new product and it does this, or here's how to get a hold of it, or things like that. So a lot of things from there. A lot of it is just you know, walking through Walmart and being like, I have this problem and I need to solve it. Oh, look, if I stack these two plastic flower pots together and add a base to them and spray paint them, it's going to look like a pot bellied stove. Um, so it's a lot about imagination and creativity, you know, not the thing can't be the thing. Uh, we have a whole uh, 40 foot shipping container outside of our shop that we call the Fru Fru a go go container. And it is full of like, it's our own little craft shop. There's like all the little random tidbits that people throw away and we'll go to DI and just buy old plastic picture frames and stuff and cut them up and just gack that stuff onto things. What, what do you call it? it? You call it the Fru Fru? Fru Fru. Yeah. It's just like all the stuff you would put on something to make it fancy. Um, uh, so uh, imagination, trying things, not being afraid to fail. Um, we made a, a water trough for a comedy of errors a couple years ago, and they wanted to actually dunk an actor in it, so I had to hold water. Um, we, we tried to seal that thing four or five different ways. We tried fiberglass. We tried buying a pond liner. Then somebody stapled into the pond liner, and that leaked. And we tried to caulk it, you know, and all this stuff. So it's, it's just being, being totally willing to, to try things and fail and keep trying until you get it right. Um, this question from Kathy is similar, and it's, it's really a question slash comment. How in the world do you come up with the ideas of using a Christmas ornament for the staff and a lollipop stick for a porcupine? And I think, um, I think it's kind of what you've just been talking about. Um, so I want to use that question to let the, you need to tell them who you are and what made Ben Holman. Tell them who your parents were and um, what you originally did, because when you walk into that, you because of your antique shop experience. Right. Uh, so why don't you talk a little bit about your background, your training, uh, so that you can start to think like that. Right. So again, it's all about imagination and creativity. And what is the end goal? What are you trying to achieve? And what materials do you have available uh, locally, mostly, to make that happen? Um, so my parents owned an antique store. They bought it uh, right about, about the time I was born, within a month or two of me being born, and had it until I was 16. Uh, and so every weekend we worked in the antique store, we went to auctions. Um, so I was around old things. Uh, we had thousands, like 50,000 books. We specialized in glassware, um, some furniture, that kind of stuff. Um, so I got a love of old things kind of really young. And then when I was like 13, I think my older sister, she's a year older than me, was babysitting me. Um, and uh, um, we, uh, her friend was in a production at the community theater. And so we went to see it. Um, and it was the best little whorehouse in Texas. Probably not something a 13-year-old should probably see. Um, but I was just fascinated by, by the event, not the story, but, but the, the show and the costumes and the lights and the scenery and all that stuff. And so I immediately started volunteering at the community theater and did that until I, I went off to college. Um, and so I, I was in shows. I, I propped shows. I built scenery. I ran lights. Um, I ran. They actually had one of the, the largest silver screens in the state of Ohio and so I actually learned how to use the carbon arc movie projectors um, and ran um, uh, movies for several months until I learned that a miner couldn't actually run a carbon arc movie projector because it could explode on them um, uh, and then I went off to college thinking, thinking I wanted to be a scenic designer and then immediately found out that no the technical direction side the sort of backstage sort of figuring out how to make it work was more interesting to me um, and then landed a job out here um, as a, a junior in college um, and got into props sort of that way um, uh, so it's really about, it's about, it's about creativity. It's about using the resources that you have available, knowing that you have a budget, um, not only, not only a monetary budget, but a labor budget. You only have so much time and we do a lot of shows all at once. And so we have to crank things out really quickly, but they also have to survive not only being on stage for three or four months, uh, but also being manhandled by the crew every single day during changeovers, um, which is a whole nother level of, of maintenance um, and stuff like that. Um, so it's really, it's really just problem solving on a massive, massive scale. Cool. Wonderful. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, the, the storage process because you have a lot of things in that warehouse. Um, a lot of things. This, is, this is from Richard. Do you photograph the items in the numbered bins so that you can show them to the designers before they arrive? How does that process work? Thank you. Yeah. Richard. So, so right now we're working on an inventory system of all of our furniture. So all of that will be in a database and people will be, and designers will be able to look at that before they arrive. Right now, if they're like, 
hey, do you have an appropriate Victorian chair or whatever? We'll run over and take photos of the things we think are appropriate and email them to them. And they'll respond back, we love that. Can we change the color? Can we reupholster? Whatever. We kind of go back and forth that way. As far as like hand prop things, we'll do the same sort of thing. If they have specific things they want to see before they get here, they'll often send us research images. We'll go take photographs of whatever we have that would fit that and kind of go back and forth until we come to a decision about are we going to use something we have and modify it in some way, repaint it, refinish it, um, or are we going to um, buy it? Uh, new or build it from scratch or whatever. Um, I mean, the long-term goal is, you know, within four or five years would be to have every single item that we have in an inventory system. So designers could look at all of that stuff. Um, that's just a really daunting task because we have so many small things, hand props, you know, mm -hmm. glasses and dishes and things like that. But um, so right now, yeah, we just, we go back and forth with them uh, via email and photos and stuff to figure out what will work. Wonderful. Uh, and Susanna, Susanna asks, what are some of your favorite storage innovations in the warehouse? Um, so I love the, I love the idea of the rolling carts. Um, uh, we saw, you know, some libraries have those awesome storage things where all the bookshelves stick together and they can roll them apart and walk down an aisle. Um, so that's kind of our version of that. We had so many hand props and not a lot of space to store them. And this allows us to store a lot of stuff in a very small amount of space, pull them out, get to what we need and then put them back in. That's one of my favorites. The other is the, the sconce wall, having pegboard on the wall and having one shade, one of each lantern out where designers can walk in and say, oh, I love that. Do you have three of them? And we can say, yeah, the tag says we have four. Great. And we can just immediately go to that bin and pull those out. Um, uh, so yeah. And then we, we constantly find new things to like fix over there or like the soft goods bins. Now that all the soft goods, like and we've, we break up bags. So we have like Elizabethan uh, travel bags um, and leather bags are separated from, you know, and then we do them by color and stuff like that. So every time we get too much of something, we have to come up with an innovative way to store it um, so that we know how easily to find it. Marielle is the queen of the warehouse. Like she knows where everything is. She does with all the hand props, organizes the carts every year. She's like, we have to expand science and personnel. We don't have enough space on that one. So we get another cart and she figures out how to separate it and stuff. And, but it's, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant struggle because we're constantly getting new stuff. Yeah, well, we're talking about storage. Uh, so you've got this large warehouse where all of the li large items and little items are contained, but there's also other areas that you store things as well. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, donations, um, uh, Vegas auctions, uh, it, that large uh, trim bin that you have. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. so we, we, we get donations of all kinds of things, furniture, uh, costumes for the costume shop. Um, somebody called us from Vegas and they bought a building in downtown and they were like, uh, we went into it and it's an old drapery manufacturing place and there's all this like trim like from the 60s and 70s and 80s and we don't know what to do with it so we went down with a 20-foot box truck and came back with you know 10,000 bolts of trim uh, brand new never opened for you know some of it 40 years old I um, mean we've used it on costumes and on prop stuff and we've sold some off at high school Shakespeare comp um, so we have a whole container full of that um, we have, um, we're actually in the middle of inventorying all of our picture frames. We have over 500 picture frames and every one of them will now have an inventory tag and we'll know what size the frame is and what size artwork fits within that frame. Um, so designers can like send us the artwork the right size. We can just print it and slap it in the frame. Um, we have uh, baskets, hundreds and hundreds of baskets in another storage area. Uh, we used to have storage all over town and now we have a 6,000 square foot warehouse that's on site with our shop. It's across the parking lot. Um, so we can walk over there whenever we want to and sort of dig through and find stuff um, but it's it's pretty full um, I know scenery needs a, a warehouse and some people need warehouses but you know we could easily use another 3,000 square feet because we're constantly getting cool stuff and I hate to throw stuff away before we throw anything away we gut it we save every small bit of it that might be useful every little decorative piece off of it um, and everything and we'll only throw away the parts that really don't have a, a life for us later um, but it's hard to throw anything away because as soon as you do the next year the director's like hey do you have a, a six foot blah 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 and we're like we used to but we don't anymore uh, so we're at about 35. I was going to wait on this question, but there are so many monkeys behind you. I think people will have a good time looking at the monkeys uh, and understanding the monkeys while we're going through the rest of this discussion. So Krista, I was going to wait on this question, but let's ask it now. Let's get the monkeys out of the way here. Does the prop shop have an official monkey mascot? And why on earth 
What is your fixation with monkeys? Yes, I don't have a fixation with monkeys. It just occurred. So in 2000, um, I was prop mastering a production of Merchant of Venice um, at the festival. And the director decided that at the end of the show, she wanted uh, Jessica, Shylock's daughter, on stage in a pool of light um, with a monkey in a cage next to her. Because there's a line in the play about the fact that she kind of lost everything, but she bought herself a monkey. And almost every director cuts it because it makes no sense. This director decided it was like the pivotal line in the play. And so they wanted an animatronic monkey. And so we spent a lot of time and money, um, a, a lot of time and a lot of money building an animatronic monkey, a radio control monkey. Um, and then at the first dress rehearsal, the director says, oh, I thought it was going to be a spider monkey, which had never been said before. Um, and so we quickly found a spider monkey after a lot of searching. This is back when the internet was still really, really new. Um, so it took a couple of days um, and a lot of money to get some more monkey options here. Um, so the original monkey that did not make it into the cage is actually, you can't see him. He's buried on the top shelf here in the back. Um, his animatronics have been removed and used for other things like mice in a decaying cake and some other things. Things. But um, and then the monkey that did end up in the show is still in its cage. Hang on, hanging hang on. Out, hanging we just got it. You just said that, yeah, like mice in a decaying cage. <laughs> you, know, you know, like like you have to do that. That that was in what show? What was the mice? Oh, the, 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 the mice were in um, uh, um, it, the uh, Great Expectations, the yeah. musical uh, yeah. exclamation point. Um, uh, Great Expectations exclamation point. The musical. Carry, carry um, on. Carry yeah. On. Um, so the, the so the monkey that made it on stage is actually in uh, still in the cage, hanging in the shop. Um, it actually made a second appearance when we did our first, no, our second production of, no, our first production of Complete Works. doesn't matter. One of our productions of Complete Works was hanging on the set and actually did a monkey dance break and allowed it to dance for a minute. Um, so that year, um, after all the monkey fiasco, a few of my staff sent me monkeys as Christmas presents. Um, and that started the monkey collection. Um, so late 2000 was when the monkey collection started. I now have monkeys from all over the world. Um, I have one from Russia. I have one from Zimbabwe that people have sent me. Um, patrons have brought me monkey fabric. Um, starting in 2000, uh, we have put a monkey in every single show at the Shakespeare Festival somewhere on stage. Um, some directors and designers don't like it, so we have to get really creative and hide them. Um, generally, it's not um, – uh, really overt monkey, unless it fits into that particular show. Uh, when we did Scapan, there was a bunch of toys and stuff on top of the Calliope. So one of my larger, um, I have a symboling, uh, a symbol crashing monkey, um, a vintage uh, toy that actually works. Um, that actually sat on top of the Calliope, so it was really prominent. Um, but um, anyway, there's been a monkey in every well, show. But the well, two angry monkeys men, are, you had rolls of toilet paper in a closet with right. a a monkey wrap yeah it was monkey tissue monkey toilet paper was the logo that we put on the, the tissue paper so um it's just a thing that we do um i now show them share them in my seminar because a, a reporter put it in the las vegas paper a number of years ago that we do that so people look for the monkeys now um i know what the tickets cost i don't want people to do that so i share in my seminar generally where the monkeys are each season um but that's where this collection has come from people sending them to me and then i buy them for the shows and we add them to the collection after or whatever but and, that's how that so, happens. so to krista's question do you have a? <laughs> um, I would say um, Franken Monkey, which is what we call the monkey that's in the cage, the one that actually ended up in that production of Merchant. It was not animatronic in the end. We just added elastic to its neck and tied it to the top of the cage. So when it, when you carried it around, it kind of bounced a little bit with the elastic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Frank is like the the second monkey, but he's the one that's probably the most prominent. So I would say he's probably the mascot if there is one. Wonderful, cool. Uh, at this point, I usually wait and say this at the end, but uh, since we're talking about monkeys, I just want to say this would not be happening and all of our other virtual seminars wouldn't be happening without the sponsorship of uh, Cedar City Brian Head Tourism Bureau. And uh, we love them. So I uh, just want to thank Maria Twitchell, who's actually watching at this point and hearing about monkeys. What's the oldest prop that you have? This is from Richie. Uh, Ooh, oldest um, prop that you have? I believe um, we have a weapon that was used in the second season of the festival. Um, it's a dagger that um, Pam Reddington's husband, Boyd, um, uh, gave to us. He had kept it uh, after the season, and he gave it back to us um, uh, before he passed away a couple years ago. So I believe that's the oldest prop we have in our – well, I mean, it's the oldest prop festival-wise. We have furniture. We have some pieces of furniture that are um, probably close to 200 years old. Wow. wow. Uh, a few pieces that, that are that and, old. And uh, Richie also asks, what is the most uh, expensive? That's kind of loaded. Ooh. That's yeah, that's tough. Um, um, uh, well, we have we have some things that are priceless. Um, things that we've built. We also have, and, and uh, Fred told me the story, and I don't remember all the details, but we actually have uh, a real human skull. 
um, mm. for, for Hamlet um, that we've used it a couple of times. We've actually shipped it to other theaters to use uh, a couple of times. Um, so that, that's priceless. Um, and Fred believes, the story he told me was, there's a, a, there's a trust, I think in New York or somewhere, where this actor, um, when he retired, he wanted his, his skull to be available for theaters when they did Hamlet, to be Yorick. Um, and Fred remembers writing to them to get a skull for a production of Hamlet years and years ago. And he said to me, he goes, maybe we just never returned it. Um, so I don't know if that's true or not, um, but, um, but I would say the skull is probably the, the thing that, because there's, I mean, it's priceless. It's someone's real hand, wow. you know? Wow. Um, um, and then some of the things that we've built, um, you know, that are just so unique, but uh, the skull is probably the thing that sticks out the most. Cool, cool. Um, let me get back into the process. <laughs> we, have. we kind of covered this in regards to your goal of gabbing everything with the archives. Cole has asked, uh, do you have a digital archive of all of your props so you can search for stuff before you try to make it new? Or is it all just jammed in bed in Homan's head? Um, right now, it's mostly in my head. I mean, luckily, when I started working here, I think we owned about 22, 24 pieces of furniture and maybe two or 300 hand props. Um, we had just started doing the Randall a couple years before I started. So we really were really just had Elizabethan stuff for the outdoor space. Um, so I've been here for um, the creation of most of our stock. Um, so I remember a lot of it. And we've moved it so much um, over the years into different spaces and into the warehouse. That between uh, Marielle and I, we know kind of where everything is and what everything is, mm -hmm. but we're getting older. And so we are working on a digital inventory um, so that that information will be available to people in the future. Um, uh, similar, similar question. Uh, you've been very fortunate to have crews that have worked with you from year to year, but uh, sometimes they're also interns or they're volunteers. Why don't you talk a little bit about the staff that you have and it ebbs and flows based on the, the budgets that we have here at the festival. So who, who is your staff made of? What type of variety of trainings right. do they have, et cetera? Yeah, so um, we have a couple of uh, um, regional theater prop masters who come in and help in the summer because we're doing so many shows at the same time that I will have either one or two additional prop masters who will help man different theaters depending on the season. Um, and then we have anywhere between um, three and 10 prop artisans, again, depending on the season and what the budgets are, um, that help build all of the stuff for each uh, show. And then we often have a couple of interns. And the, the artisans range anywhere from people who've been in the business uh, building props professionally for up to 20 or 30 years. Uh, we had a retired material scientist for a number of years who found out about us through a seminar and came up every year and, and volunteer and worked in the summer for us um, and brought a lot of mechanical knowledge and stuff, did a lot of special effects for us. Uh, we have, he built you an organ. Is that right? He yes, he did. Um, we have we have graduate students who are in prop programs. We have undergraduate students who are in, in theater programs across the country. Um, and then we also often look for one or two, you know, freshman or sophomore theater students um, who are looking to make sure that props is what they really want to do before they really get into their uh, education too far. And so we have uh, one to two internships every year that spend about four weeks in the shop uh, helping get things started. And then they switch over and become part of the run crew. And they run, uh, run the shows in the theater for the summer and also help maintain the props uh, over that process. Um, so that's basically kind of how the shop is, is sort of made up. Cool. Wonderful. Uh, and, and where is your warehouse? Michelle asks, where is this warehouse located? And before you tell us that, uh, can you tell a little bit about, you've been here and seen a lot of history at USF. So why don't you talk about where, what we used to do to store props and then how we acquired this property and, and, you know, get this warehouse and then what your dreams are for the future. Um, yeah, so when I started here, we had two separate shops. We were in the, the trap rooms of our two indoor spaces, so in the Randall and in the Auditorium Theater. The prop shops were sort of relegated to the basement. We'd go upstairs and borrow the, the scenery guys' tools to build stuff. Um, and then over the years, we finally moved into a, a, a prop space. Um, uh, we called it Gower. It was an old construction building. Um, and we were there for a number of years. And we still had warehouses kind of all over town. Um, we had some storage in the theaters and places like that. Um, and, uh, and then we bought uh, this property, which is the scene shop and the prop shop um, around this property, as well as a number of storage buildings uh, for different departments. Um, we bought this, I think, in 2002, I think, 2003. Prop shop moved out here in 2009. Um, we added an addition onto the scene shop building, so we had a space to work. Um, we built the warehouse, um, I think, a year or two later, 2011, 2012, I think, um, and then moved all of the stuff in, into the warehouse. It's 6,000 square feet. Um, like I said, it's pretty much full. We, we tend to find space for more stuff, but... Um, 
uh, we need to sort of build up this entire facility. Scenery needs a real storage area. They currently use the old feast tent um, as their storage. Um, so we need space for them um, and space for some other people. Costumes has some storage out here, but they could use a little more of that kind of stuff. Um, but long term, I think we could build another three or four steel buildings out here and just continue to expand. Because the more stuff we have, the less we have to spend Right. Because we can reuse things. I mean, it does re still require work to pull it out and reupholster it or repaint it or things. But but the actual item itself, the purchasing of the original item, is the most expensive part. Um, uh, so uh, having more storage never hurts. hurts. Cool. cool. Uh, Susanna asks, besides spam, which you mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, are there other groups or pages that you suggest joining? Um, uh, spam has a public Facebook group uh, called... Um, Props and Beyond, um, uh, which is great and has a lot of uh, members active in it. Um, there's some other groups. I'm not as familiar with them. Um, if you're in the on your East Coast anywhere, there's the New York Prop Summit, um, which is really big in the New York area and sort of the East Coast um, that meets every year. Um, but you know, contacting your local theaters and seeing what the prop people are doing there and that kind of stuff um, is always good too. Cool. But, um, Tracy from Tracy, she asks, how do you decide if you build a new prop versus repurposing something in stock? Who that's, uh, that is always a sort of a case by case basis based on a couple of factors. Um, how much labor we have, um, uh, budget, um, and is it super useful? Like, will we use it again? Um, so if it's, if it's something that we will use a lot, or I think it's really beneficial to have, um, we may decide to build it versus repurposing it. Um, right. Uh, or sometimes it's like a, such a unique thing that we're not going to hold on to it. Um, so instead of bastardizing, cutting up something from stock and modifying it, we'll build it from scratch, knowing that at the end of the season, we're not going to hold on to it. So we'll build it um, so that we'll survive the season, but we'll then, we'll then go away. And we won't have spent a lot of time and resources on it or depleted our stock by pulling something out of stock and modifying it and then not having that for future use. So it's, it's really a case by case, show by show. Uh, do we have the resources and what's the best use of those resources? Does it improve stock? Is it specific to the show? So it's really, yeah, it's a bunch of different factors. Cool. Let me slay two questions at the same time. One from Tracy, one from Cass. This is, what are the hardest props to create? Is there a specific prop that was a nightmare? Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I was going to throw something else in there, but let, let's do it. Let, nightmare prop. Um, uh, uh, there's two I can think of. One is um, uh, one of my favorite props, uh, which I'm sure uh, people are into. Um, we actually did Little Shop of Horrors a number of years ago, and they decided um, we should build the puppets and rent them, um, which we did for a number of years. Um, and I never really built, I love puppetry, but I've never uh, built large scale puppets. Um, so trying to build a set of Audrey puppets from scratch, not knowing enough about it, um, was really challenging. Um, but also really rewarding when we finally got to the stage and, and they worked and the and puppets they lived were, all and the over the world loved and, and, and we rented them for years and now someone bought them up in Salt Lake from us finally and now they, they use them all the time. Um, uh, the other nightmare prop is we did um, Mary Poppins a number of years ago and there's a scene in the musical that is not in the movie where they go to the letter shop and it was decided for our production that instead of building a structure for that, they were going to use basically a gypsy cart. And they wanted this gypsy cart that the girls could write in on and it had like random letters on the canopy. Um, and then at one point in the song, they wanted it to magically expand from six feet long to 20 feet long and on the side spell out supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Um, and we worked on this thing and worked on this thing and, and, and we got it to function correctly until we put the canopy of fabric on. And the canopy of fabric was so heavy that when you expand it out, it would just collapse in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I finally, after probably two weeks of working with several artisans and trying to R&D this thing, and, and, and we tried everything we could think of, I finally went to the director and designer and said, we can keep messing around with this cart and try to make it work or we could do all the rest of the notes on this show. And they decided we should do all the rest of the notes on the show. So the cart went back to just being a six foot cart and we put a scroll in the back that would pull out and spell out supercalifragilistic instead of the cart actually expanding. So it was one of the times we've sort of failed and weren't able to achieve what the director and designer um, envisioned. Though the designer told me from the get go, she's like, I've designed this crazy cart. I'm not sure it will work, but if it will, it'll be cool. And we weren't able to make it work. And from Cole, what is your favorite show that you've worked on? Can, can you say that? Can you say what's your favorite show? Um, there's been a bunch. I actually was thinking about this last night a little bit. Um, I'm going to list off like five. Um, 
Um, every time we do Midsummer Night's Dream, the director's concept is always super great. I loved the 99 production with our puppets um, and our oversized props. Um, I loved the 2011 production that Fred did with the giant tree. Um, I loved the tavern we did a couple years ago um, where, where with the windstorm and all the special effects in that, that was a challenge to tech and then figure all that stuff out, but that was super fun. Um, Blythe Spirit which we did one of our early fall seasons. I like a lot of the effect shows where things have to do stuff. So it's not just a prop, but it has to like, you know, do things. Um, uh, and the Tempest, the magic in the Tempest. But every time we've done the Tempest, it's always been fun to sort of figure out how the director wants those things to occur. So mm -hmm. mostly the effect shows are probably my favorites. If I had to choose one of all of those, I would probably say the 99 Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. um, because they did the, the director's concept was just, you know, all the fairies were uh, 18 inches tall. That's Russell so, Trays, right? Yeah, Russell Trays. Yeah. So when all of the when all of the when the, just the fairies were on stage, all their props were oversized fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So a giant apple and a giant, you know, um, asparagus spear as a weapon and a walnut shell chariot for someone to ride in on and stuff. And we just, I mean, they literally would bring me fruits and vegetables from the grocery store and say, "This, this is your research. You know, build something this like this, but it's four feet tall or whatever." And so we had to sort of figure that out. So cool. Um, I have a goal. We're going to get through every single question, man. <laughs> okay. How do you define a prop? What is a prop? This what is, is a prop? Brilliant. Okay. So um, there's two ways I, I describe it often so people understand it. The first is if you think about moving, everything you put in the moving truck is my job. So even a clothes that you're not wearing, if they're hanging in your closet, that would be considered set dressing. And so that would be a prop. Uh, it's only a costume when you put it on your body. So all of the furniture, knickknacks, uh, clothing, uh, all that stuff you would put in a moving truck um, is, is a prop. The other way to think about it is if you think about a room, scenery is responsible for the floor, the walls, and the ceiling mm -hmm. or the staircases. Mm -hmm. Everything else in that room is a prop. Cool. So the furniture, the knickknacks, all of that stuff. So it's, it's, the, it's one of the favorite things about, I mean, I'm, I'm ADD. Um, uh, have been all my life um, and props is great because it is so many different things it's weapons and it's greenery it's plants it's food it's furniture it's desk stuff it's you know it's just it's it, it's so every day is a different challenge and different things yeah cool uh, how often do you share and ship props with other teams <laughs> um uh, we um this is from Kathy by the way yeah uh not as often as we normally, not as often as I have at other theaters. Um, because we are so isolated out here, um, we're so far away, that oftentimes by the time we pay to ship, like we actually rented um, a moose head um, for a show for room service um, a number of years ago from Oregon. By the time we actually rented it, shipped it here, had it for the summer, and shipped it back, we could have built our own moose head. Um, uh, so we tend, unless it's a very specialty prop, we did Sherlock Holmes. We rented the, the drug paraphernalia kit that's Sherlock's from Milwaukee Rep, from Jim Guy at Milwaukee Rep, um, and because trying to build that again was, was dumb. Um, we have a deer that we built um, for um, uh, As You Like It, and we rent our deer quite a bit. We ship our deer across the country because most people don't do Shakespeare often, so they have no reason to have a deer, but we do it a lot, so we have a really good deer. Um, but because we're so isolated, the shipping costs tend to not be um, – uh, beneficial for us to do a lot of borrowing. Um, but every once in a while, either we'll ship something out or we'll get something in that's very specific and we just don't have the time um, to, to create ourselves. Cool. Two questions. Uh, one with, uh, one's a little shorter than the other. What is the most difficult animated crop? Um, whew. Uh, the, the puppets from Little Shop come to mind. Um, also in the tavern, um, we had a, a, a goose, a duck that had to fly across uh, the window and flap its wings and they get stuck in the windstorm and they get blown backwards. Uh, we had to build that a couple of times to make that work. Also in that show, we had a, a cuckoo clock that had a duck instead of a cuckoo. Um, and the duck had to pop out and quack and then go back in. Um, and so the doors had to work, the duck had to pop in and out. The clock actually functioned as a real clock as well. It's actually hanging in our shop as a functioning uh, clock um, uh, since the show. We took the duck out because um, it had to stick out the back of the clock to work correctly. Um, those are two or three of the probably the most complicated animated props that we've worked with. Cool. And uh, I think this is a good closing question. Uh, talk about the research you need to do for each prop. Oh my goodness. Um, again, it depends that, a little bit. Hard, but we're, we're in that process right now, <coughs> yeah. designing the next season. Yeah, it depends a little bit um, on the show and the time period. But um, 
Uh, sometimes the designer will do some of the research, sometimes it's on us, but we will we'll do research like, you know, when were ballpoint pens invented to make sure that, you know, if we're giving an actor a ballpoint pen in the 40s, is that appropriate or not? Um, you know, those kinds of things. So we will, um, there are timelines online, you can do research, we have books, um, you can look up patent numbers. I have a list of, you know, every year that patents were invented, so if you can find a patent number on something, you can do it that way. Um, you do a lot of, we have a ton of books upstairs of period research, like what's Victorian, you know, what would be appropriate for that, um, you know, uh, early 20th century, you know, what did electronics look like? So it depends on each show and the, and the props. Sometimes you ask the dramaturg um, for help with, you know, what was money like in this time period, you know, those kinds of things. We have what's actually- What's a dramaturg? A dramaturg is basically a research assistant for the director who will who will research whatever they need. Um, uh, um, they'll research like historical battles or historical context for the play and provide all that research not only to the director but to actors if they request it. Uh, and to we prop, can prop directors. Yeah, yeah, we we can we can bug them out things. You know, I have a book called Historical Money of the World. And it has black and white images of money from every country dating back, you know, as far as they can find research for. And so we'll scan those in and, and print them out larger scale and color them and make them look appropriate. Um, so some props can take days and days and days of research. Um, so you have to back it up. Other times you'll do all the research and you'll go to a director and say, like they wanted a, a bicycle um, in a production of, I think as you like it a couple of years ago. And they wanted, they were setting it in like the 14 or 1500s or something. And I was like, the, the first known bike is like 200 years in the future from where you are setting the play. And they're like, yeah, we don't really care. And I'm like, okay, well, then I need someone to tell me what this wants to look like because they didn't exist in this time period. So sometimes no matter how much research you do and how much you tell them, like, this is not appropriate, people are going to write us letters and say, you have the wrong gun in that show or the wrong, like, they didn't have bikes back then or whatever. They're just like, I don't care. It's fun and I like it. We're just going to do it. And you're like, Great. Okay. Perfect. Um, so, um, but the research, I mean, the research is fun trying to figure those kinds of things out and learn. Like I have some of the most random facts in my head over the years. Like when barcodes, the first barcode was on a, a stick, a pack of gum. I think it was Wrigley's gum um, in the late seventies was the first time barcodes were used. So if you try to recreate a period uh, package and you're using a, a modern package and it has a barcode on it, if you're before the 19, mid 1970s, you got to remove the barcode. You know, it's just like random stuff like that that you learn over the years doing this. Cool. Uh, final question, and then we'll say, and then we'll close. Uh, uh, if if someone wanted to go into this profession, uh, what gifts do you need? What, Imagination. What, what what advice would you give to them? Imagination, creativity. Um, start building things now. Um, don't steal anything that belongs to a family member, um, but start finding junk and putting it together and making cool stuff and looking online and um, cool. yeah, be creative. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Facebook patrons. Uh, thank you, those that will be watching us later on tonight. These are all going to be posted on our virtual website, uh, which you'll find at bard.org on the, on the homepage. Uh, we're looking forward to next week. We're going to be doing this all summer. So Thursday at 10 o'clock, we will be talking to the casts of Every Brilliant Thing. And then on Friday, we have another production seminar at 1 o'clock, which we're very excited about. It's going to be a Dan. You want to tell us a little bit about that? What's going to happen at that seminar? Yeah, so Dan Giedemann, who's our new scenery director, um, is going to take one of the designs that was going to be for this year that we're moving to next year. Um, so the renderings from the designer, Apollo Weaver, um, and um, basically talking about, as a scenery director, what he looks for in those drawings, like what he's looking at as he looks at those drawings to figure out what he's going to need to do to make the show a reality physically um, from those renderings from the designer. Wonderful. So please continue to join us. Thank you for joining us online. We appreciate it. Thank you, Cedar City and Brian Head Tourism Bureau. Just so you know, just because we got COVID going on, the mountains are here. There's wonderful thing. We'd love to have you all come down and join us. J continue to join us virtually. Stay safe and thank you very much. Bye-bye.